Hey everyone, instead of our normal intro, I just want to make a quick announcement that it's coming up on the end of the year 2021 here, and Emma and I want to spend some time with our families, things like that. So, so there will be only two more episodes for the rest of the year. We're going to skip that last day, December 31st, just for the previous week being Christmas so we can spend more time you know, with our families hanging out and enjoying our holidays a little bit more. So sorry about that inconvenience, and we will get back to the story as soon as we can in the new year. Thanks so much, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Is Fitz Happy? I'm Luke. And I'm Emma. And this week we're discussing part two of chapter 22. And it's still... Dilemma, right? No. Departure? Nope. Departure. It's departure. a D word. Yes. <laughs> Is that departure. right? Correct? It's departure? Okay. <laughs> I'm not going crazy. No. Yes. I just, it, you know... <laughs> gotta put my name in there somewhere figuring out the chapter title was a dilemma <laughs> okay <laughs> last way where we last left off was the skill dream that fitz had with verity where verity dunked his hands in the skill river in a elderling city that we do not fully know the identity of Kind of discussed maybe Kelsingra, but Emma thinks it might be a different city in a different place because there's no evidence of that river in Kelsingra when we go there later. Also, all the mention of sand. So we come back and Verity puts his hand, his skill hand, onto the skill ghost of Fitz. And he is pushed back into his body with an enlightenment moment. He connects everything that Verity has to do and what their plan is and what they have to do and why they have to do it. And everything goes black after that. He forgets all of that information. And back in the real world, in Chade, or excuse me, uh, in Fitz's, wow, I'm really messing this up, in Fool's Cabin. Yes. <laughs> in front of Chade and Kettle, I believe, is there as well. Yes. Still, he has a seizure. A particularly bad one, it seems. And this is the first one he's had in a really long time yeah. that we know of. Yeah, it is. I think it's the first one, this book, for sure. Okay. That's what I think. That's fair. I was going to say maybe when he was still transitioning from wolf to human, there were seizures. Oh, there might have been a couple. Those were scary, and so yeah. the wolf didn't like those either or something. That does ring a little bit of a bell. Mm -hmm. But this is the first, like... Probably first one in a year for him then, or close yeah. to a year for him. Yeah. After he recovered. Fully so. conscious, yeah. just Fitz seizure. <sighs> and so Starling is crying out in fear. Fitz kind of hears through his haziness, and he hears Chade reply... It's only a seizure, such as he has from time to time. His head, fool, hold his head or he'll dash his own brains out. And Fitz sinks into the darkness and doesn't recall anything after that. He comes to a little bit later, and he's drinking out of a cup that Chade is holding to his lips. Fool is raising his shoulders and steadying him while he's doing this, and he can taste the elf bark, and he has a glimpse of Kettle standing very disapprovingly over Chade's <laughs> shoulder, looking down with a uh, lips folded in a tight line of disapproval, quote unquote. Starling stood away, her eyes huge as a cornered animal's, not deigning to touch me. That should bring him round, I heard Chade say as I sank into a deep sleep. So you get a little opposition or a little juxtaposition there. <laughs> that should bring him round, and, and then, he just passes out. Yeah. I don't blame Starling for being super freaked out. Um, I have witnessed a seizure in real life before, and it is very scary, especially if you aren't prepared for what's happening. I knew what was happening because it was a coworker of mine who had warned me ahead of time that it happened. But like, if you didn't know anything about seizures and you watch somebody like flail like that, it's a little scary. It's, yeah. 
And oh, so I feel really bad for everybody involved. More so Fitz because he's the one living through it. But <laughs> um, I think that would be a really hard it's very situation. Startling, that's for sure. Yes. What did you take uh, or make of Fitz passing out and falling asleep instead of coming back around with the drugs that Chade gave him? Hmm. Ooh. Um, I guess I didn't super think into it, but now that you say that, I feel like I should. <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't think you need to think too deeply on it. In my opinion, it's just exhaustion. Mm-hmm. He is always incredibly out of it when he skills. Right. He's always extremely exhausted and he is still recovering from like his surgery. You know, right. He's still weakened state. And this time he said, like before the beginning of the dream, he said that this was the strongest a skill dream has been in a long time. Right. So, I mean, he took almost a full day to recover from blasting apart the coterie strength. And obviously this didn't take probably as much of his strength as right. that would have, but it's still an incredibly exhausting experience, especially if you are touched by pure skill, even through like a skill connection, which I don't know what that feels like. Right. But- <laughs> right. I suppose maybe the reason he falls asleep is because the elf bark cuts him off from the skill. Yeah, I would assume um, so. It just kind of and without the deadens skill, him. Yeah. Without the skill, there's no reason to stay awake or to not that he's like, not in a depressing way, <laughs> but like there's nothing to feel for anymore. It's completely cut off. Yeah. Yeah. It allows him to basically just shut your brain off. Yeah. And be able yeah. to just give into the weariness, like mm-hmm. you said. Yeah. I don't know. That was my take. I didn't know if you had any other like. <laughs> no, I was just like, oh, neat. <laughs> Kept going. <laughs> so I know that's a that is a point later on where. I think Kettle is very wary. It was like, hey, like asking Chade about like what kind of drugs he used because it said he was should bring Fitz around and then immediately fell asleep kind of things. So. Right. And I don't think Chade would not know a mixture right. that he was and, giving, well, especially to Fitz. Especially Elf Bark. Like that is used for energy. Right. It's literally like a lesser Kara seed, if I can say that, because <laughs> even though it does have bad side effects on the back half of it. Kerosene can literally kill you if you take too much. So kerosene is also like too much energy. Yeah. yeah. Like been drinking Red Bull for like 10 hours and nothing but Red Bull. (laughs) Heart palpitations energy. Yeah. And so he comes around the next morning. He sleeps through the night. And he slips out of the house starts to go and get ready to meet Ketrickin, because that is what Chade was there last night for. Again, just recapping a little bit of last episode. Right. Chade came by and said, hey, be careful around Ketrickin. She is hurting. She's grieving. She's angry at you. I can't save you in there or help you out. It's you and your queen. So he slips out to get ready. Right. Also, he was reminded that being presentable in front of a queen means bathing and being sober. Yes. (laughs) So he is starting that. And while he is walking out and going to the baths, Night Eyes comes up to him and asks where he went last night. So again, this skill dreaming, as we see, we've seen it a couple times now, kind of excludes that wit link because it's just that part of his brain being extended through that, you know, that magic. Right. And Night Eyes can't seem to follow that. He lives in a different part of his brain or something. Right. It's interesting. Well of magic. It's interesting because Night Eyes can follow skill. Yeah. But it almost feels like he can't follow Fitz's mind in the skill. Only Mm -hmm. like a connection in the skill. Yeah, exactly. And and this could maybe reference him having the seizure as well and getting cut off and passing out. But I I don't think so. I think it's more the dream. Right. Because Night Eyes has experienced the other part more frequently, I would guess. Yeah. (laughs) And after he asks Fitz, Fitz is reluctant to say what happened. And so in a huff, Night Eyes goes off to hunt. Yes. And he advises him not to drink anything but water after that. So (laughs) we all know Night Eyes' opinion on alcohol. It's poison. He's he's killing himself doing it. (laughs) 
So Fitz goes to a bath. He scrubs himself clean and submerging himself in the hottest water that he could stand. Tried not to recall the scalding of the skill on Verity's forearms. He, I, I, I noted that description because at the end of this chapter, there's a nice little callback to him needing to go to Verity, not just because of the call anymore, but because of what he felt. Right. And that call of the skill. So here, him trying not to, you know, trying not to recall that is him trying to resist that temptation of like, well, I need to be complete again with right the barest hint of what I felt through that skill dream with Verity. Yeah. So I just wanted to make that quick note because I think the first couple times I just read through is like, oh, it was an experience just calling back to the dream. Cool. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's totally fair. It's definitely something that is on his mind and will continue to be on his mind. Yeah. So he's also trying to look presentable. So he starts shaving and he tries not to think too much on his face because it reminds him of Verity's. Very, very, very gaunt. But some of his has left, his gauntness, because he's been recovering. Right. And eating. Verdi has not. Not. <laughs> not much. And he's very... He's always been very reluctant to dwell on his face. And see the impacts of the events of his life and how that has left him scarred or broken in his eyes, the white streak of his hair, his broken nose, the scar down his face from when Regal kicked him or slapped him. I think it was a lot of those different things are there. And, and he's thinking on that and his encounter last night. And with again, dwelling on the skill with the amount of power that he felt in just that, touch from the skill from Verity's hand. Right. He wouldn't have been surprised for all of that to been healed, which I also thought was interesting. It just puts into perspective how much how much power that actually was and how much Fitz is dwelling on this because that's right. that's also something that as I mentioned, he has thought about a lot and he hates how he looks now because of all of those events that brings up those bad memories. Right. And it's really interesting that this encounter has left him feeling almost reborn in a way, maybe, because he does expect to look different and he doesn't. Um, it's I don't know. It's just an interesting thing to do to get the reader thinking about how a change should have happened is so great that this experience was. And yet he is just the same old fits that he was yesterday. And Nothing physically has changed, even though it seems like it should have. <laughs> yeah. A, a lot of this last book here, starting with this, I think, hints at the potential for the skill and leads into future books. Because we get these descriptions and the end part of this paragraph here is him trying to recall the full experience of that touch and the mm -hmm. full experience of that pure skill is like a bare ember versus the bonfire of that skill river. Right. And before this, we all, you know, we get that description of this is, a, you know, reaching out to the skill and connecting with it is the perfect moment ever. Right. And then you get it's barely anything compared to this. <laughs> right. It kind of sets up that there is more out here. There is more that is happening. Verity is a magnitude, multiple magnitudes of strength, like stronger than fits in the skill mm -hmm. and more apt. And I think it's it gets a reader wondering like, okay, where do we go then? Right. There isn't just like, oh, you master it. The coterie isn't like the, the most powerful skill members or skilled users, you know? Right. There's something else beyond there because there's a river of skill now. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And I think like you said, it gets you thinking of what else is possible with the skill because we've only, we've only seen it used as mind magic. It's something yeah. you can use as a weapon or, but only or spying or yeah. changing thoughts. Yeah. It's, it's touching the brain. There's nothing else. And then there's this hint of 
it's physical too. Yeah. Yeah. It actually exists somewhere. Right. And you can coat your arms with it. But also the description of Verity coating his arms was terrifying. Yes. Um, yes. And so that really speaks to the fact, I mean, it describes his arms as be, the flesh being eaten away, the flesh and muscles being eaten away. And then like burned off and yeah. replaced. <laughs> and they're still there when he pulls them out. It's just the skill. And it's like, how addictive and good feeling is it if he endured that much pain and was still like, I should maybe dump my whole body in this and I need help getting back from the edge. <laughs> I'm I'm imagining it similar to dunking your hands into lava with all the descriptions that were on there. Yeah, because yeah. It, it was burning off. It was like pulling your hands out of stone. It was eating away the flesh and replacing it with its own, you know, material or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It just. Having it likened to that makes me think of, OK, actually dunking your arms in lava would be horrifyingly excruciating like your mind couldn't comprehend it but at the other hand with this skill there is a pleasure that is competing with that pain and overpowering the pain even yeah. so like it's still pleasurable even though it hurts which is insane how much pleasure that would be True. and like you said drives the addiction yeah it's i don't know a little scary and fitz is chasing that high Mm -hmm. And he can't quite, he can only remember a barest memory of that. And like you said, Emma, it leaves him changed. Mm -hmm. It guts sort of that anger that he was festering towards Ketrikin and Chade. And he kind of sees to the heart of like what's going on around him. He doesn't agree with anything that's no. happening. But it just removes all of the vitriol that he had harbored and was ready to spew out. Right. It's really interesting because I think this is the most introspective that Fitz ever is in this moment he is thinking about the anger he has been holding on to and why his friends may be mad at him and he thinks about how they think what they're doing is morally right that doesn't mean that they're correct in that assumption and or there's no malice in their intent no or it's they're not, not like yes. purposely trying to do him ill will like you know this isn't to punish him in some way this is just what they believe to be right and that doesn't mean he has to agree with it or think it's right but it also means that there's not some big bad this isn't let's punish Fitz more and yeah. that gets him to step back and it's impressive <laughs> that this little that the skill was able to give him that I don't know. It, sure, it's impressive, but it's also scary because something else completely preoccupies his mind now. True. That took away from this thing that he's been lingering on for the past week while recovering and being drunk for three days in a row. You know, like, it's it's scary that, yes, it's a good moment for him to move past this, but in order to move past it, it's replaced by some other obsession. True. Okay. Yeah. So... I, like short term, yes, great. <laughs> Long term, more harmful. <laughs> right. No, I just think it's really interesting. The change in fits. Yeah. The temporary change. And and he even says, like you said, he puts it in perspective. He even says here, I could no longer deny entirely the sense of what they sought, meaning Ketrikin and Chade, bringing Nettle in and claiming Nettle as Ketrikin's own. Right. It left him feeling soulless. They would take my child away from Molly and me. I could hate what they did, but I could not focus that anger at them. So now I'm wondering, this thought just came upon me. If the skill stone, if it's the skill part of the skill stone taking away the humanity. Except there's a disconnect a little bit because there's no pleasure and that only because your whole consciousness isn't there. You're just giving. I feel like this experience of Fitz's with the skill. Has left him. He gave away that anger right to the skill. Now he's focused on the skill. And I wonder if that's what it does. If that's. I don't know if that Possibly. makes sense. If I'm like wording this well. <laughs> A little bit. But I don't think that. I don't think the skill river. Works like the skill stone. 
in the sense that like you give up and no. give up an emotion and like let them take this from you kind of thing or the skill in general works like that. I think it's specifically the worked skill stone that you can do that with. But in the sense that skill is based in memory overall and everything that you can do with it is pretty much based in memory. I agree with you there in some sense. I just personally think that the experience he had and the emotions he felt while touching or being near that pure skill just dwarfed any issues he had previously okay. or that one little flash of epiphany and enlightenment that he had by touching that pure skill with Verity. Right. Allowed his subconscious to get past that because like, Oh, it's for a purpose. It, it allowed him to see different perspectives in a way. Right. That's what I think at least. Okay. And then even though he can't quite recall like at all the details about it, it just allowed him to move past. Right. What he was harboring. Yeah. I guess what I'm, more so trying to say is the skill seems like something that takes more than it gives Mm. and i think up until this point on this reread i have been thinking of the skill as this cool ability and like yeah sure there are downsides but for the most part it's magic that's so cool and i think this time this rereading especially reading it so close it feels a little bit more like a curse then this cool thing because it's not just this cool magic that you get to use there's a price and yeah it just keeps taking there's no see the the issue with that is it could be a curse in this day and age but when there was actual skill masters who were trained properly yeah because verity never completed his training that's true he's not properly trained either it wasn't that much of a danger there were issues still yeah but i don't know but i i can see that I, I I view skill, I guess, more like a force of nature, like the force of memory itself, okay. because it's so integral to dragons. And that's like the cycle of nature that the fool wants to bring back. Right. It's how they regain memories of their past lives and everything like that. Like silver is what they run on. Yeah. That liquid yeah. skill. Interesting. So I... I didn't feel like it only took, but they took a lot because it's meant for dragons and right. the silver gives back to the dragons of what they need to know to keep going, you know? Interesting, right. It, it just feels it just feels like silver or skill was not meant for humans ever. <laughs> that's fair. I don't know. And that's why the Farseers are kind of unique, where it like always pops up in their bloodline. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I just thought it was an interesting perspective change for yeah. me personally, too. That is interesting. Um, but. Yeah, the skill isn't, you know. <laughs> it's not all fun in games. Yeah. Give and take. <laughs> and so he's cleaning up. He's getting himself ready. And he's wondering what Ketrakin would see in him now. How, how she would perceive him. If he was still the the young man who dogged Verity's steps at court, who was her friend, who served her, would she look at his scarred face and think that she didn't know him anymore? That that Fitz was gone and it was different now? And he finally decides, well, she would... She should know how I would get these scars now. She shouldn't be surprised. I would let her judge who stood behind those marks, which is what he should do all the time. Right. But it's a good little moment (laughs) of self-reflection. Be like, come to terms with this. They have to make their own decisions. Right. Based on what I'm doing. And, you know, to be fair, this is a good reminder that Ketrickin hasn't seen Fitz with his face like this. Well, he, she has because she saw him while he was suffering with his illness, but she hasn't seen him standing upright and somewhat healthy <laughs> or shaved <laughs> or shaved with the way his face has changed. Right. So he gets ready. He pulls on his shirt, heads back to the fool's hut to fully clothe himself with new clothes and fresh clothes to get ready to go up to the the quote palace that they have, I guess it's <laughs> yeah. not really a palace, but the central Royal family location here. Here he finds clothes already laid out for him. White loose sleeve shirt of soft, warm wool. 
dark leggings of a much heavier woolen weave, and there was a short, dark surcoat, too, to match the leggings. Fool told him that Jade had left them there for him. It was all plain and simple. And it suits him. Yes. It... He isn't complaining about it for once, yeah. so it must be well, very simple. <laughs> Ch- Chade will, Chade provided the clothes, and he's not going to dress <laughs> up his assassin apprentice, I bet. That's you know? true. Also, they are trying to pretend like this isn't Fitz Chivalry. Yes, this is Tom the Shepherd, still. And the fool is dressed up as well here a little bit. Fitz remarks, I did not know that Ketrickin had summoned you, to which he grimly replied, all the more reason to present myself. Jade came to check on you this morning and was concerned to find you gone. I think he half fears that you have run off with the wolf again, but in case you had not, he left a message for you. Other than those who have been in this hut, no one in jean has been told your true name. Much as it must surprise you to find that the minstrel had, has had that much discretion. Not even the healer knows who she healed. Remember, you are Tom the Shepherd until such a time as Ketcher can feel she can speak more plainly to you. Understand? I sighed. I understood all too well. I never knew jean Pei to host intrigue before. He kind of laughs that off and says, Well, we were just visitors and we best not get entangled because they have as much intrigue as uh, Buck does because they are an older court, actually. <laughs> yeah. Than the six duchies. Right. So. It's very naive of Fitz to think that just because he didn't know about it, there wasn't. <laughs> yes. So they're starting to walk through and from farther off in the village, Fitz says he can hear the shouts of children at play. Night Eyes pricked his ears to that, but continued to shadow us. I thought that little line was cute because I know when they do leave, Night Eyes stays in the village to play with the children a little bit before uh-huh. catching up. Yeah. Which is cute. I like that Night Eyes likes kids. Yes. <laughs> He's like, I want to be around little kids. <laughs> the fool brings up the topic of the seizure. And he says Kettle seemed very distressed by it. She questioned Shade most closely about the herbs he had prepared for you. And when they did not rouse you as he said they would, she went off in her corner. She sat there most of the night, knitting loudly and peering at him disapprovingly. I love that phrase. Knitting loudly and peering (laughs) at him disapprovingly. It's so good. Yeah. Because you can just imagine. The, like, (laughs) clacking of the... the... Little sighs or, like, little... (coughs) Humph. (laughs) Anytime Fitz even slightly moves the the pause and then... (sighs) (laughs) it was a relief to me when they all finally left he says who is kettle the fool asked abruptly who is kettle i asked startled i believe i just said that kettle is it suddenly seemed odd that i knew so little about someone i had traveled with so long i think she grew up in buck and then she traveled and studied scrolls and prophecies and returned to seek the white prophet I shrugged at the scantiness of my knowledge. Tell me, do you find her portentous? What? Do you not feel that there is something about her, something that... He shook his head angrily. It was the first time I had ever seen the fool searching for words. Sometimes I feel she is significant, that she is wound up with us. Other times she seems but a nosy old woman with an unfortunate lack of taste in her choice of companions. You mean me, I laughed. No, I mean that interfering minstrel. Why do you and Starling dislike one another so, I asked tiredly. It is not dislike, dear Fitzy. On my part, it is disinterest. Unfortunately, she cannot conceive of a man who could look at her with no interest in betting her. She takes my simple dismissal of her as an insult and strives to make of it some lack or fault in me, whilst I take offense at her proprietary attitude toward you. She has no true affection for Fitz, you know, only for being able to say she knew Fitz's chivalry. I was silent, fearing that what he said was true. A couple things to tackle in that passage, and the first is uh, Kettle. The fool thinks she is portentous, but is very confused as to whether she's important or not. Which brings me to think that there is a future where she helps Verity, and there is a highly also probable future where she is not there at all at the end. Mm-hmm. 
And I don't know where that switch happens or what decision makes her move on. So I'm going to be keeping my eye out for that. That's fair. I think it's really interesting because we know that she has been shut off from the skill and that she was at one point a super important person and has been living in, I don't know if exile is the right word, but um, she has not been welcomed home. I mean, she was exiled. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> but I mean, she's still in Buck, so exiled from the castle only or, you know, or was she, she was in the outer duchies? Yeah. Not necessarily in Buck, so maybe just Buck. I don't know. I guess I should... The duchies in general. Yeah. But anyway, so I don't know. I think it's really interesting. Her character anyway is super interesting and why she would stay after this. But maybe it's wanting to leave her legacy somewhere, knowing that she can't be the catalyst, but the catalyst is someone important. And so maybe she has similar feelings to Starling. Um, I don't know that for sure, but. <laughs> so what does that do with the fool's options that he sees then? I think it's whether or not she wants to make a lasting impact or maybe it's whether or not she's around enough to see that they're going to make the dragon. I don't know. I would have to continue to look out for it, but I just think. That her duality is probably what makes it so hard for the fool to read her. That's true. She has a very, uh, very, how do I want to put this? <laughs> very plainly, but the wrong word I, that I don't want to use is a very bad past, I guess. Where she struggled uh, and you know, killed her sister. Right. <laughs> so, of her own coterie. So I guess that she is struggling with that decision of like forgiving herself and moving on and being able to, you know, I think, isn't it her sister's name that unlocks her mind or something like that for the skill? I don't remember exactly. And I don't remember exactly when the conversation was where she reveals this is that in the quarry or is that on the way i think it's on the way but i don't know okay so if it's on the way i'm kind of thinking that might be the the place where she becomes more important but i could be wrong i don't know maybe it feels like the fool has seen two futures and doesn't know which one it's going to take maybe this is another Fitz thing where Fitz has created this important person by simply being in the right spot at the right time and a catalyst. So yeah, or maybe, he will have to create her or choose not to create her as right. an important person. Yeah, I don't know. So maybe it's something about that where she's not necessarily a full catalyst, but I mean, without her, I don't think I wouldn't call her a catalyst at all. I think there are catalysts in different varieties i don't know like sure i i just feel like she isn't being moved by the fool the fool doesn't interact with her as much like too much but it's more fits doing the shifting so i feel like she is part of the events that are shifted by the catalyst rather than the ones then her making you know the events of the world move around her you know yeah, I I think that's fair. I just think I'm reminded that the fool has said to Fitz before that when he looks at Fitz, all of the futures are possible and none of them are possible. And so this is like a much smaller scale. But I don't know. Like, I don't think catalysts need to be used by a, a white to be able to be successful at being a catalyst. Oh, I right. Guess. I don't yeah. know. Um, I don't know. The white's there just, just to guide the catalyst. Yeah. I don't, so I don't know. Maybe it's nothing, but just a thought I had. Yeah. And then there is Starling mentioned in here as well. We finally get the fool's side of why they don't get along. Which I will start off by saying is very unfair to Starling. <laughs> it is a very superficial reason. 
probably born mostly out of jealousy or uh, a sense of protectiveness for Fitz because part of what he says is true. That last part particularly, that she doesn't care for the man. At the end of the day, maybe a little bit. Like, she's like, oh, this guy's kind of cool, whatever. Like, he's nice. But, like, at the end of the day, she wants to make a song about Fitz chivalry. Right. The witted bastard who helped save the king, you know? That's, That's her ultimate goal. But the part about, I don't know. I just think it's slightly unfair to her. But also, I don't know, maybe could be a little true. <laughs> I don't know. There's there's like hints in there and the fool never directly, never really lies. So this would be like the first big, you know, hiding up of the true nature of somebody that he's told to fits as far as I know. So it'd be out of character a little bit. But I don't, I don't know. what are your thoughts? I don't think it would be a lie per se, but maybe a clouded judgment on his part. Because like you yeah. said, I think there's a little bit of jealousy there. Um for a lot of reasons, not just romantic <laughs> jealousy. I think there's also the jealousy that his close friend chose to tell her information that he r- lied to him about. Right. And that would be really hard to take. I don't know. I think it was a little bit of a low blow on his part because he probably knows that Fitz has a thing about people not really caring about him. But I think it's a little bit, I don't know, it's a little weird to be like, she is doesn't like me because I don't think she's pretty or whatever. And not pretty, but like, I don't see her as a partner potential partner candidate and that makes her upset and like maybe something about that does rub her the wrong way could be um but maybe she just doesn't like fool's attitude (laughs) it does pop up later on when they're on the uh the journey up towards the quarry again where she is insistent that the fool is a woman and in love with fits and i feel like if this part is true, then that like she finds her own since she is so confident in what she knows and finding like her own reasons for things. Mm-hmm. That's the explanation that pops into her head to explain why the fool isn't attracted to her in a way. That's you know, that's, fair. that yeah. that would be like the linking back to this part that he wouldn't be that he is actually telling the truth. I just feel like. It is so clouded at this point it's hard to tell like if this was actually 100% what he sees or just trying to get Fitz away from relying on Starling well I don't even know that he's like not saying what he sees even if it's wrong I don't think he's all like unfailing I think he can read people the wrong way he's still human ish (laughs) so I think it's but it's 100% possible that the fool really believes that Starling feels this way and that Starling doesn't necessarily. And maybe the reason she thinks that the only way that the fool could like fits is if it, if he's actually a woman could be because she's never encountered any gay people. And so she can't fathom a man liking another man. And so it's like, you have this person who ha- is a little bit more androgynous and look, which we know, even though he in this goes by he, him pronouns and dresses male, um, there's still a look about him that is androgynous. And so I could see somebody looking at that and somebody who isn't fitting the role of man that they've known their whole life and thinking clearly he's being mean to me out of spite because he's actually a woman and loves fits. Not necessarily he's being mean to me, because he like should like me or what it's because I think he should like me. It just like, why would somebody be mean to me for no reason? He's in love with Fitz, but he can't be in love with Fitz. He's a dude. Oh no, wait, it's not a dude. It's definitely a woman. I know everything. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> so that's, I feel like how, you know, yeah, which is small minded similar to what I was. Yeah. Yeah. And so with that interesting conversation about kettle and starling, and confronting Fitz about those a little bit, leaving him to think on it, they come to jean Pei's palace. He once again describes what this place looks like. 
we've had descriptions of it before. I don't know if you want to touch on any of it. Um, I do want to say specifically that Fitz is calling it a palace because of the size. Yes. That it encounters, not um, because of any other feature that makes it look like a palace as he knows it. But yeah, it's got the rounded window or windows. It's got the rounded walls. It has a live tree growing in the middle. There are live trees making up the walls. Mm -hmm. Um, They have been artisanally done. This has taken generations of work and it is beautiful. It shows that the craftsmanship is above all. We get kind of the same description as we did in the first book about it, that there's like no really guards or anything like that. And they get to a chamber where the outer walls were decorated with delicate illustrations of water birds. Yes, which I believe we read the first time we came here. Possibly. Um, I don't remember these are Ketrickin's chambers. Mm. But I do want to make a quick note that something important about here is that most of the rooms in the palace are temporary. That unlike other palaces, they're... People can come and go as they please, and this isn't really something that, you know, stays year long. So Fitz doesn't really know how to get where they're going because he's never been in this layout, um, which I thought was important because at first I was like, why doesn't he why does he have to follow the fool? But things have changed because they are temporary walls yep. and that only the people who reside full time, like the sacrifices, get permanent dwellings. Yep, and this room that they are led to is one of those permanent rooms. Mm-hmm. They're led in, and he can hear Starling playing the harp from within, a low murmur of voices. There's a bunch of people in there just kind of knitting or sewing or talking quietly or whatever, just hanging out in Ketrikin's room. And she is in there introducing him to the others as Tom and asking after his injury asking if he was recovering well. So that's their cover for getting Fitz in there to talk to the queen to see how he was doing because he is a stranger who was severely injured that came upon their village or whatever. And it's good for the sacrifice to be, to to look in on, on the people of her village. Right. It's also important to note that the like sewing and activities going on is going on on top of a quilt. So everyone, it seems, is sat around this giant quilt and there's people embroidering the quilt. Some people quilting, which is different (laughs) than like sewing. Um, But it is like a community quilt building, which actually sounds very fun. (laughs) And the fool joins a friend. Joffrin. Joffrin. And starts adding butterflies of his own creation to this garden, um, which I thought was really interesting because it made me think of Bee and how she has all those visions about the butterfly. Butterfly man and stuff like Uh that, yeah. And so I'm wondering if that's like maybe a prophecy and he doesn't know it. I don't know, but probably not. Just something that made me think of it. So he's glancing around the room here, Chase avoiding his eyes. Starling met his briefly, but mostly it's people talking to one another, being preoccupied, and Fitz trying to relax, being the only one not doing anything. So he has this anxiety building up in him, and he has to constantly remind himself to Be stress-free, like untense your shoulders, untense your jaw, relax a little bit. And it took some time for him to see that same anxiety in Ketrikin as well. Fitz mentions that he had spent many hours in Buckkeep attending her and notices some of those little tics that she has about her to notice her mood and things like that. And he's notices that she's sewing furiously as if the fate of the six duchies depended on her completing this quilt because mostly she was always before been lethargic (laughs) at her needlework. Right. She was thinner than I recalled the bones and planes of her face showing more plainly her hair a year after she had cut it to mourn Verity was still too short for her to confine it. Well, the pale strands of it constantly crept forward. There were lines in her face, around her eyes and mouth, and she frequently chewed on her lips, a thing I had never seen her do before. 
The morning seemed to drag on, but eventually one of the young men sat up, said, hey, like, you want to go do something to a woman at his side? And everyone kind of agreed that this was getting old. They're going to go hunt it or something. You know, they're going to get right. up and leave. And Time to leave the queen alone. Yep. Fitz was once again struck at their familiarity with her, but then remembers that she's a sacrifice here. It's not like the royal family in Buck, and we're once again reminded that the Mountain Kingdom is different and works differently than the Six Duchies, which does come into play a little bit later on when they're preparing for their journey. Yes. Also, this makes me more sad for Ketrikin when she went to Buck because of how close everyone is and the family feel here. I mean... There's no stuffiness. She doesn't have to think about how she's acting and what the ladies are going to think and bestowing favor on one or two to get the rest to try to get her favor. And there's none of that. There's just friends sitting around a quilt. And that would be really hard to go from that to Buckkeep. And yeah. I feel very bad for what she lost. And Fitz even wonders here if it might have been... It might have suited Verity more to go to Ketrikin to be her consort at the Mountain Kingdom instead, because that would suit his lifestyle way more, too. Oh, yeah. I think Verity would have loved it here. Yeah, 100 (laughs) percent. Fit chivalry. I looked up to Ketrikin's command. Only she, I, Starling, Chade and the Fool remained in the room. I almost looked to Chade for direction, but his eyes had excluded me earlier. I sensed I was on my own here. The tone of Ketrikin's voice made this a formal interview. I stood straight and then managed a rather stiff bow. My queen, you summoned me. Explain yourself. The wind outside was warmer than her voice. I glanced up at her eyes, blue ice. I lowered my gaze and took a breath. Shall I report, my queen? If it will explain your failures, do so. That startled me. My eyes flew to hers, but though our glances met, there was no meeting. All the girl in Ketrikin had burned away, as the impurities are burned and beaten from iron ore in a foundry. With it seemed to have gone any feeling for her husband's bastard nephew. She sat before me as ruler and judge, not friend. I had not expected to feel that loss so keenly. Despite my better judgment, I let ice creep into my own voice. I shall submit to my queen's judgment on that, I offered. And so he starts to retell his story. Not from, you know, when his when he was recovering, but a few days before even the when the king died before that, when they were planning what was going to happen. What went wrong? What's happening? And I think this is so interesting because we have. A very angry Ketrikin, rightfully so, who has lost her husband more than once and lost her child, lost her kingdom, lost her new people and lost her father's help because her father is trying so hard to find a way to go to war with Regal at this point because of what Regal has done. And but also like they as a sacrifice he literally doesn't care about his daughter's feelings in this because he does right. what's best for the kingdom. It's like even more so estranged from what Shrew did and if he cares about Verity's feelings, you know? It's like right. King Aod is the sacrifice. He will do what's best. Ketrikin has no power, literally. Like she can't, she doesn't do anything besides like people know her more. Yeah. You know, that's it. Yeah. It's weird yeah. interaction, but it's... yeah. <laughs> So poor Ketrikin has gone through all this change and loss in the past little over a year and is sitting in front of someone who she thought was her friend, who she has no idea went through the horrors that he went through. She probably has some idea from Chade. Right. But but Chade doesn't know either. Yeah. Chade doesn't have the full story because Fitz didn't tell the full story to anybody yet. And so, yeah, they know he got beat. In the dungeons. And sure, they can see the scars on his face, but that's a little bit different than being told minute by minute details of all of the horrors that he and 
he endured. Um, so to be fair to her, she doesn't super know what he's gone through in this year. She just knows that he knew her husband was alive and didn't come straight to her to tell her he left her there. And, and also that there is a secret heir. Yes. That she didn't know about either. Which, to be fair, he might not have known before she left, which he didn't. I don't think she thought that. But then when he knew when they were talking to him, I think that made her like he knew the whole time. So, <laughs> so I think she's been like hurt too many times to like feel any sympathy in this situation. Mm-hmm. And I do not fault her for being as upset as she is. I also find it a little humorous that Fitz just had this whole grown up moment of like, you know what? I'm going to be the bigger person. And like, well, he I'll never said humble. he was going to be the bigger no, person. No, <laughs> but like, there's this whole, he, ha- he throws a vibe of like, I'm going to be a bigger person. And like, I understand their line of thought. That doesn't mean that I agree with it, but I know that they're trying to do what's right by them. And then the second she gives him sass, he's like, oh, we're going to be like that. <laughs> and he gives it right back. So doesn't listen to Chade about <laughs> respecting his queen. Yeah, he still does. He's, he does. He's formal. It's just tone. Right. You know? Well, that's still disrespectful, <laughs> according to my parents. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we go into this with this little exchange of two people who have felt they have been wronged. And neither truly understanding the other and where they're coming from. Yeah, because we know all of what Fitz has gone through and how Mm -hmm. badly used he has been. Right. And to be fair, Fitz doesn't get a recounting from Ketrickin. He also hears what she went through secondhand. She doesn't have to go and like stand in front of him and tell her him every second of her life. So he'll, he'll never really get that sort of understanding from her. But... He starts by giving his. Yep. And so he starts by explaining how the coastal duchies approached him, offering him to lead, how he declined that, but said that, you know, I'll defend Buckkeep while possible. And he recalls the conversation he had with Chade that that's as close to treason without being called treason as it wouldn't even matter, really. Right. And he was... Fitz remarks that he's tired of all of his secrets. He doesn't care anymore. He just relentlessly bared them all. More than once, I wished Starling were not in the room, for I dreaded hearing my own words made into a song denouncing me. But if my queen deemed her worthy of confidence, it was not my place to question it. And so I went on down the weary track of days. For the first time, she heard... Heard from me how King Shrewd had died in my arms, and how I had hunted down and killed both Serene and Justin in the Great Hall before everyone. When it came to my days in Regal's dungeon, she had no pity on me. He had me beaten and starved, and I would have perished there if I had not feigned death, I said. It was not good enough for her. No one, not even Beric, had known the full telling of those days. I steeled myself and launched into it. After a time, my voice began to shake. I faltered in my telling. Then I looked past her at the wall, took a breath, and went on. I glanced at her once to find her gone white as ice. I stopped thinking of the events behind my words. I heard my own voice dispassionately relating all that had happened. I heard Getrickin draw in her breath when I spoke of skilling to Verity from my cell. Other than that, there was not a sound in the room. Once my eyes wandered to Chade, I found him sitting, deathly still, his jaw set as if he had endured some torment of his own. I do want to pause there because he was enduring some torment of his own. Mm -hmm. He had, they had basically known that Fitz was there, known it was going to be bad, and Chade didn't know how bad. He has to listen to that. He's probably thinking with the farseer guilt that (laughs) this is my fault. I let my boy be in this dungeon. I gave him the Karis seeds to give him the strength to go on this run. Yeah, I'm to blame for all of this happening to Fitz. And, you know, it's not true because that's that's what humans do. We blame ourselves for events that are out of our control. Right. But it's realistic and he is going through something on his own some torment of his own as Fitz remarks and to be fair i don't think they knew that he was put in 
a circle of men that were just beating him to the ground. No, they didn't. While a skill coterie member was trying to get in his head. So he literally couldn't fight them back at all there. I think there's a difference between, oh, clearly they're hitting you and, oh, they were hitting you for sport and taking turns while you were basically tied down. Like there's a huge difference in those two things. Neither are good, but one is clearly worse than the other. Yes. And is horrible to think about. And I just think about how it's so sad that Ketrickin was trying to be stubborn and probably just wanted to like, I don't know. I need everything. I'm the queen. Uh huh. Kind of thing. Thinking, oh, he's going to say he got punched in the face and I can feel good about the fact that somebody punched him. Like if I can't. And then it's this horrible story, this horrendous telling of these terrible things that happened. And she made him relive that. And I can't imagine like, Thinking you're just mad at somebody and like this will make them feel pain and then realizing how much pain because we've all been there. I think at some point in our life where we're that mad at somebody where we just want to make him hurt and then it does and it doesn't feel good. But this is like that to a thousand. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I like I have sympathy for Ketrickin because she didn't know. But also I have way more sympathy for Fitz in this. And I think it's really crappy that a friendship like this she pushed on something that he was clearly uncomfortable talking about because it's Fitz and Fitz does usually just talk about things so clearly there was something more there and she didn't care yeah. and oh my gosh I don't know this this chapter specifically I have felt the most sympathetic towards Fitz I think I said that last uh last half of the chapter for last episode but Man, the way he is dehumanized in this, it, not just the telling of his beating, but the way that he is made to stand there and recount everything of his life and expected not to spare any detail. And then even after that, it's just kind of dismissed. Right. You know, it's not like it's not like there's sympathy then it's like, okay, well no, it doesn't excuse your failures, but we'll move on with our plan to steal your daughter. Yeah. And, and we'll take over the journey to save Verity. Cause I guess we have to do that. I mean, we'll get into that, but right. And you know, it's just, yeah. there's no, yeah, I don't know. It also makes me really mad that catcher can gasps when he mentions Verity because like that, seriously, that that seriously, he's in the middle of talking about how he had to literally die in order to survive this. And you're like, Verity. And it's like, oh, my God. Yeah, he's you already know he's alive. Yeah, you Fitz oh, already you know? said that he's alive and he's going to go to him like you don't have to gasp from something a year ago. Yeah, like, uh, I don't know. That really <laughs> made me mad because it, it's not like this is the first time she's heard that he's alive since Fitz has been back. And like that maybe would have excused it. But no. Oh, and at that point, she should have known he was alive anyway. So whatever. That made me really frustrated (laughs) with Ketrickin. (laughs) And I'm not normally mad at Ketrickin. She doesn't usually get my ire, but I would like to have some strong words with her. (laughs) So he continues on with his story, uh, telling of his resurrection, of his recovery and the angry parting that he had with Birk and Chade. He tells of his time on the road and the moments that he could sense Verity and his attempt on Regal's life, and even how Verity had unwittingly pl- implanted into Fitz's soul Verity's command to come to him. On and on, my voice getting huskier as my throat and mouth dried with the telling. You know, sometimes I can I can understand that feeling on this podcast. <laughs> well, I, we talk a lot, so I make, I make sure to drink water. But man, I am not used to talking, even after a full. <laughs> Almost two years of this? Yeah. (laughs) I did not pause nor rest until I had finished telling her of my final staggering trek into jean And when at last my full tale of days was told out to her, I continued to stand emptied and weary. Some people say there is a relief in the sharing of cares and pains. To me, there was no catharsis, only an unearthing of rotting corpses of memories, a barring, a bearing of still separating wounds. After a time of silence, I found the cruelty to ask, does my account excuse my failures, my queen? I would like to point out that 
usually the relief and sharing comes when you're doing so willingly and not when you're being with, forced <laughs> with other people who care about your what you're saying around you right and who are like it's and a safe care, environment but there's no yeah. reaction <laughs> yeah they've already decided they can't react so like yeah i don't blame fitz for being like ah oh, wow that's supposed to feel better but i feel way worse after that like oh buddy yeah i would too that's not fun that oh i feel really bad for fitz i hate this so much and so Ketrakin responds, you make no mention of your daughter, Fitzchivalry. It was true. I had not made mention of Molly and the child. Fear sliced through me like a cold blade. I had not thought of her as pertaining to my report. She obviously must, Queen Ketrakin said implacably. I forced myself to look at her. She clasped her hands before her. Did they tremble? Did they feel any remorse for what she said next? I could not tell. Given her lineage, she must be more, she, she much more than pertains to this discussion. Ideally, she should be here, where we could guarantee a measure of safety to the farseer heir. I think Ketrican feels really bad. I think so too, but she's also learned what she must as yep. a ruler, yep. Yep. which is to be very cold. I don't think she must and calculating do that. I think that's what she thinks she must, if that makes sense. Yes, but in this case, in her eyes, this is what she must do. And right. to do that, she probably has to be cold, otherwise break down. Yeah, no, definitely fair. And I think it's easier if you like set that wall up to do the hard things. But... I think the hand clasping is to, like, give herself strength. I feel like that's like a you can do it. You just have to get through this part. <laughs> See, it's so it's so vague in that description that it could be a, you know, there there's so many different ways to clasp your hands. It could be something like holding them from trembling or it could be just like a, you know, a gently folding or interlocking of the fingers laid across like your midsection as like a smug kind of like. Oh, you didn't see this, though. You didn't think it pertained to the report? Excuse me. That's fair. So there's so many different ways you can take it You're that right. there's not enough detail in there for me to, like, Think one know. way or the other? Yeah. That's super fair. I think um, my bad habit of only st seeing the worst in fits <laughs> is coming through <laughs> where I'm like, well, it's Catcher Kid now. So. <laughs> so even though I'm really mad at her, <laughs> I'm like, well, she means well. <laughs> Which is not nice, and I shouldn't. I should treat everyone equally, but my children are not equal in this book. <laughs> <laughs> well, Fitz tries to claim that her bloodline does matter. She's illegitimate, you know, like that's right, and not just uh, illegitimate, an illegitimate child of an illegitimate child. Yes, and Ketchikan's like, no, only the bloodline matters. Obviously, descendant of the Farseers, your blood's strong. I'm childless. I'll have to claim her, you know. And when she says, I am childless, Fitz says, until he heard her speak that word aloud, I did not grasp what her depth of pain was. A few moments ago, I'd had thought her heartless. Now I wondered if she was completely sane anymore. Such was the grief and despair that one word conveyed. She forced herself on. There must be an heir to the Farseer throne. Chate has advised me that alone I cannot rally the people to protect themselves. I am too foreign to their eyes still. But no matter how they they see me, I remain their queen. I have a duty to do. I must find a way to unite the six duchies and repulse the invaders from our shores. To do that, they must have a leader. I had thought to offer you, but he has said that they will not accept you either. That matter of your supposed death and use of beast magic is too big an obstacle. That being so, there remains only your child of the Farseer line. Regal has proven false to his own blood. She, then, must be sacrificed for our people. They will rally to her. I dare to speak. She is only an infant, my queen. How can she? She is a symbol. It is all the people will require of her right now that she exist. Later, she will be their queen in truth. I felt as if she had knocked the wind from me. She spoke on. I shall be sending Chade to fetch her here, where she may be kept safe and properly educated as she grows. 
She sighed. I would like her mother to be with her. Unfortunately, we must present the child as mine somehow. How I hate such deceptions. But Chade has convinced me of the necessity. I hope he will also be able to convince your daughter's mother. More to herself, she added. We shall have to say that we said my child was stillborn to make Regal believe there was no heir to threaten. My poor little son. His people will never even know he was born. And that, I suppose, is how he is sacrificed for them. Again, a lot to unpack. We've been railing against Ketrakin and being unfeeling here, and in this passage, we get a little pushback from the narrative itself, how Chade is right in saying that she is deeply hurt, deeply alone, and she is bereft of anything that had given her hope for so long that this little outcropping of there is a Farseer error, you can still win back the six, six duchies and your kingdom. And how that must feel to be withheld that information right. is so angering because she lost everything. This is one thing that can give a life raft, you know? Right. And she was alone in her grief without a support system, really, because all of her support system was trying to, you know, stop an invasion on the border. Right. It's not exactly <laughs> conducive to helping a grieving mother. And also um, we see here a little bit more of Chade still in very much control of advice for right. the direction of the Farseers, which is... I will say is very good for this time period, but in Tawny Man trilogy, when Ketrakin is taking back more of that ruling, that is a good time period for Ketrakin to do that. Right. But right now, Chade is the most correct and right. probably, you know, best person to direct the right. the energy. Well, he has the most experience. And he has a little bit more insight. So that does help with decision making. And I think it's really interesting that Ketrickin mentions that she was willing to give up the throne to Fitz. If that would be what was asked of her as sacrifice. That Which I also just want a quick aside. She looks past the beast magic and everything. And like yeah. him being dead and stuff. Didn't matter to her. Yeah. He was like, still well, Fitz is alive. He, he could be, you know, king or whatever. Yeah. So there is still love there, friendship or otherwise. <laughs> yeah, she's not super prejudiced in, in, no. in any way. She is a good person. But she's hurting. <laughs> and, ugh, I just... But she is so heartless in this to Fitz. Come on. <laughs> I know. She is really mean to Fitz, but I'm, like, sitting here crying right now. Um, this is not a visual media, so you guys can't see it. But I literally cried while Luke was reading that section. <laughs> it is... So sad that Kedrickin feels that the only way to move forward is to continue with a farseer heir and that that is the best decision. And she does that knowing that that is what's good for the people, not for her. And her line about, oh, I can't, <laughs> about her child, the, the way he has to be sacrificed is by not being no. recognized yeah it's so sad yeah it is and so fitz is studying ketrickin here finding that there's very little that remained of the queen that he had known at buckkeep seeing all these changes in her and hating what she was saying making him angry with with her decisions and, and what she was saying was necessary and asking Gently, despite that anger, why why do we need to do this? Varys alive. You know, I'm going to find him and bring him back, and together you guys are going to rule. It doesn't matter that I have a daughter when I'm going to bring back your husband to you. Right. You can have children of your own. Yeah. Shall he? Will we? Will they? Almost she shook her head in denial. It may be fit chivalry, but for too long I put my faith in believing that things would turn out as they should. I will not fall prey to those expectations again. Some things must be made certain before further risks can be taken, 
An heir to the Farseer line must be assured. She met my eyes calmly. I have made up the declaration and given a copy to Chade, with another to be kept safely here. Your child is heir to the throne, Fitz Chivalry. And Fitz goes in a spiral. He thinks he's talk thinking in his head right here of all the different things and and what he must become to Molly. He realizes he's talking out loud. He's thinking he he was hoping that he could just, you know, go back to Molly, win her again with his love, and could claim the daughter as his own. And other men might dream of high honors and riches or deeds or valor sung by minstrels, but he just wanted to go home to a small cot, his back aching from work, hands rough, with a little girl in his lap, and a woman who loved him by his side. And of all the things he had ever given up simply by being a farseer, that was the dearest. Why must he surrender that dream, that hope now? Must he become to Molly forever the man who had lied to her, who had left her with child and never returned, and then caused that child to be stolen from her as well? Again, like I said, he had not meant to sp speak out loud. But Ketrickin replies, That is what is to be sacrificed, Fitzchivalry. Nothing can be held back for oneself. Nothing. I will not acknowledge her then. The words burned my tongue to speak them. I will not claim her as mine. You need not, for I shall claim her as mine. No doubt she will carry the farce your looks. Your blood is strong. For our purposes, it is sufficient to know, sufficient that I know the child is yours. You have already acknowledged that to Starling the minstrel. To her, you said you had fathered a child with Molly, a candle maker from Buckkeep Town. In all of the six duchies, the witness of a minstrel is recognized by law. She has already set her hand to the document with her oath that she knows the child to be a true farseer. Fit chivalry, she went on, and her voice was almost kind, though my ears rang to hear her words, and I near reeled where I stood. No one can escape fate, not you nor your daughter. Step back and see this is why she came to be. When all circumstances conspired to deny the farseer line and heir, somehow one was yet made by you. Accept and endure. They were the wrong words. She might have been raised to them, but I had been told, the fight is not over until you have won it. I lifted my eyes and looked around at them all. I don't know what they saw in my face, but their faces became still. I can find Verity, I said quietly, and I will. They were silent. You want your king, I said to Ketchikin. I waited until I saw a scent in her face. I want my child, I said quietly. What are you saying? Ketchikin demanded coldly. I am saying that I want the same things you do. I wish to be with the one I love to raise our child with her. I met her eyes. Tell me I can have that. It is all I have ever wanted. I cannot make you that promise, Fitzchivalry. She is too important for simple love to claim her. I read a lot there, and there's a lot to talk about, but we're still right in the middle of everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so hard. Like It's so hard to even talk about it or even think of what to say because it's all written so plainly on the page right. of how each of them feel. Fitz, all that Fitz ever wanted since learning about his daughter is to, or even before that, just to break away from the Farseers and live with Molly. Right. You know? But he always has that, that Farseer blood in him. It's like, I have to help out. I have to do something. But that romantic in him is like, someday, though, someday I can. I can just retire and go live with Molly, the one I love. And when he had his daughter add into that picture, he gladly accepted his daughter in that picture. I just want to go to the farm and, and retire and be with the ones I love. And someday, after Verity, maybe, he'll, he'll let me do that. And now he's here in front of his queen saying, nope, your dream is gone. Yeah. And... And Ketrickin's sitting there like... We lost everything, and that's the only hope for the Farseers. Yeah. And it's so hard because there's no one to be fully mad at, 
right? No. You can be frustrated with both sides. It's the but worst situation. Both of them are coming from such a deep place of hurt. And Ketrikin is also desperate in this situation. She has also just lived the worst year of her life and has struggled through pain. And like, this is her thing that is keeping her going. And it's not fair that her thing that's keeping her going gets to be the thing that wins out um, in this moment and Fitz's doesn't. But I think that it makes it hard because you understand where she's coming from. Right. And it's not this like, horrible thing that she's doing from no for no reason and you can really tell the difference between Fitz and Ketrikin and maybe even Chade because Ketrikin is so just I want to say the word patriotic she is so much of a sacrifice she is willing to give everything and that is just what it means that's what's happened to her and that's who she was raised to be and she is accepting that fate because questioning the fate is probably really hard right now after Mm. losing a child yes so maybe that's all there is is fate and this is the role that we have to play and fits who has also been raised in this way to give everything to the Farseer, to give everything to his country and his family can't accept fate because that means that he's destined to be this horrible being that is dirty and awful and gross and just somewhat Doomed evil forever to be yes. a killer and a tool and to be unhappy. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what fate is, you know? And, ugh, I don't know. (laughs) It's so hard. My heart breaks for both of them. And it's a good parallel for what Fitz kind of felt early on in the chapter. And then that feeling that gutted him after, you know, coming out of that skill dream. Right. Where he knows the anger, but he can't direct it at either of them. Right. The anger is rekindled in this scene for Fitz, directing at Ketrikin. But for the reader, we kind of get that, like... That whole gutting of the emotion. It's not yeah. railing against one side or the other. Like you're being ridiculous or like you're being too heartless. It's like, oh my God. Like, they're <laughs> both right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so they move on in this conversation here. And this part right here, starting with this part, really makes me think that they don't even fully grasp what happened to Fitz in the dungeon because they have no understanding of how the skill works right. at this point. So Fitz is saying like uh well he's he's dumbstruck by her straight refusal that i can't promise you that you're gonna have your daughter and he pauses there and ketrikin continues i know what you will say next that if i claim your child for the throne you will not help me find verity i have considered long and well knowing that this will sever me from your help i am prepared to seek him out on my own i have the map Somehow I shall Ketrikin. I cut into her speech with her name, said quietly, bereft of her title. I had not meant to. I saw it startled her. I found myself slowly shaking my head. You do not understand. Were Molly standing here before me with our daughter, still I would have to seek my king. No matter what is done to me, no matter how I am wronged, still I must seek verity. And this is where I want to pause because it leads into the next paragraph here. They don't know what the skill did to Fitz. Right. They don't know that it literally burned into every fiber of his being that he has to go to Verity. Right. It's literally has to that he already tried to turn around and go to Molly, but he literally physically could not. And so it begs the question of. They don't understand the pressure that the Coterie and Will were putting on Fitz when he was in the dungeon, when he was getting beaten, being forced to stay awake for longer periods of time so as not to give up his guard, being hounded this whole time, being, you know, confounded in Regal's castle. I'm sure Fitz did the very cursory and then the Coterie was attacking, like confusing me with their mind and brought me there. And and they were hunting for me. But they don't know enough to press on those points like Ketrikin was doing with the dungeon. Right. With like, he beat me. They understand the beating. They wanted those details, whether to be exact or to be cruel or whatever. 
but they don't know enough to press on the points of like, what did they do to you? Right. So that's super evident here because he says like, I would literally have to still seek out Verity, even if Molly and my daughter were right here telling me to stay. Even if I am wronged, no matter how I'm wronged by you guys, I literally have to go. And everyone is like proud of him. Yeah. Jade like, lifted his head and looked at me with fierce pride shining in his eyes. Ketrickin turned aside, blinking at tears. I think she may have felt slightly ashamed. To the fool, I was once more his catalyst. In Starling, there bloomed the hope that I still might be worthy of legend. But in me, there was the overriding hunger for the absolute. Verity had shown it to me in its pure physical form. I would answer my king's skill command and serve him as I had vowed. But another call beckoned me now as well. The skill. So yes, it's twofold on Fitz's part that like he has to physically go because of the skill command, but he also wants to go because the actual skill is calling him from that right. skill dream. But they still don't understand. And that's what frustrated me so, so, so much about this chapter is that they literally don't understand where Fitz is coming from or take him at his word. No, he's literally said it straight out like two or three times this chapter and no one has questioned it or like said like, what Oh, do he's mean? doing this out of his volition because he says he has to, because he's still a farce here. No, he literally has to. There is no choice. I'm ranting at this, but like, it's so frustrating. Yeah, it, it is frustrating and it's, I think this chapter really shows that maybe Fitz isn't being facetious when he says that he's just a tool in this life that he has and that there is no choices for him. I think this is the best view into why he feels that way, because over and over and over again, people are disregarding his feelings, disregarding what's actually happening and putting their own spin to it to make it what they want so that they can use him for something else and to justify using him for the next thing of like, yeah, sure, that was bad, but see, you're still for home and country and you want to find verity and it's not about want mm -hmm. it's a have to and Go, those going into this chapter like before we had our podcast here but rereading it like in between there i was i was thinking about like oh but maybe like i guess he could have explained to them what exactly it means but it literally says in the chapter that he explained yeah. And said that he put like an immutable command in his brain to go uh -huh. to Verity. <laughs> so. And everybody's like, wow, you're so loyal. And he's uh. like, what? <laughs> what? No. <laughs> uh. I wouldn't even know how to react if I was him there. Be I know. Like, it, seeing all that like pride and stuff, it'd be like, this is the worst. Yeah. Like, you don't nobody, understand me or what I'm doing or what I have to do. Nobody's listening. Yeah. Nobody's. I literally and, explained my life story where I got tortured and I have like CPTSD from it, like, and no one cares. Yeah. No one responded to it and no one listened when I said the details of what happened to me. And you like forced me to say those details. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. I, I don't know. It's so, so, so frustrating and, and makes me so incredibly sad for Fitz here. Right. And to your point, he probably did tell the story about when he tried to turn back to go to Molly. Uh, I, I don't think he did because that had to he, do with his daughter. He excluded Molly and his daughter oh. from the whole telling. So he didn't tell that detail, which which is another thing. I'm like, oh, he could have explained that if he did the full report like that. But like, well, he that's victim blaming at that. No, point. no, no, like, no. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I think maybe he did say that. That's like another thing they're ignoring. But. Maybe he I, I don't just think cut he out did. that it was because Molly was pregnant or to go to Molly. Maybe he just said that he turned around, he couldn't leave, and then had to come back. Yeah, because he, he literally, at the end of his storytelling, he said he didn't mention Molly or his daughter at all. Right. So, But there are ways to yeah, tell that was, part of the story without mentioning them, Right, is what I meant. They wouldn't be able to make the connection between the two then. Right, if, and it wouldn't be as details. important. But so no. Fitz could have explained more, but like... That's not on him. That's a, no, not at all. Like he's told him in different ways and he doesn't need right. to give an example. You know, right. and and like you said, I they mean, they should trust him. Right. They should <laughs> trust him. Um, but like you said, they don't understand. They've never dealt with the skills. So they like have zero. Right. Level. It'd be like if you started talking about trigonometry to me, I like, sure, that sounds right. I, 
anyway, next thing. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and not that that is on Fitz at all. I still think it's horrible. But like, I do understand this ignorance on their part, it, not fully. And maybe that is because I'm blinded by living in Fitz's head through the whole situation where it's like, how could you possibly overlook this? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're not fully to blame. No. You know, I'm just, it's so it's, incredibly frustrating because yeah. it's the situation where they're not, it's not just, I can blame people and be done with it and be mad at them because they just don't have the context to ask the questions that would reveal those answers or even the context to understand what he was saying. They right. don't know that the skill can do that. Right. And you know what? To be fair, uh, Fitz does not have to take Ketrick in. He for sure could leave her. He is just being nice by saying, like, I have to go anyway, so I guess I'll go with you. Like, well, part of the I skill mean, command has just come to me. It is not bring my wife while you come and, like, take care of her and stuff. He, he's, he doesn't even say in here that I'll bring you or whatever he's just That's saying it. still i must seek verity and it kind of just ends up with her arranging everything and then telling him the details of like we're leaving now you know next chapter yeah <laughs> so again he's like left feeling helpless of not being in control of his own <laughs> right like I, command <laughs> i feel very bad for fitz i uh... <sighs> and i do want to say everybody as we've said before, this chapter does not change my feelings on Ketrikin or Chade or the Fool. No. <laughs> they're all wonderful people. I love them all as characters, but they're all so frustrating in this. I noticed you left out Starling. <laughs> yeah, I know. She's she's there as a witness, and I'm mad at her for other reasons and not this. That's fair. This That's one fair. she does not know fits before these events. Yeah. So, so this one isn't on her. <laughs> this one is not on her. <laughs> She, it's not her yeah. place, even as a minstrel, to ask questions during this. Right. Like, it's not the fool's place. Chade never pipes in. Like, it's just Ketrikin. And, but, like, oh, man. It's so right. frustrating. Because even the fool here is like, oh, he's once again a hero. I mean, this is from Fitz's eyes, obviously. Right. So it's biased a little bit. But Fitz knows the fool and he can see hope spark in the fool's eyes. Like, I could change right. the future again. It's just right. frustrating that, like, no one is listening to him. That is very frustrating. And I agree. And I do want to say that I love all of these characters, like, a lot. So, <laughs> so even when I get really mad at them, it's all from a place of love. They're all faulted in some way. Um, but I do want to say that I think potentially the fool is just excited that um, the path is bright again. Like, could be. it's for yeah. sure. And not necessarily like, oh, fits my hero. It's probably like, right. <gasps> Oh my god! Like oh my god! It's happening! Yeah, yeah. Like, that could be that could be true. That's probably more likely than yeah. just because I don't see the f- uh, the fool like misunderstanding this to the point where he's like, "Wow, my catalyst!" I see this as like a <laughs> yes, yes, I was right. It's gonna happen. Oh, it's like, on. <laughs> yeah, like not that that's better or good, but like I don't think this is come. Fitz may have seen that's it that fair. way, but that's definitely fair. Yeah, I think that I, the other two. Uh, Ketrikin and Chade definitely probably what they were thinking. Oh, 100%. They're like Ketrikin like turns away with tears in her eyes as as if she was ashamed. Yeah, because Ketrikin's thinking oh, I I feel ashamed that I ever thought that Fitz wouldn't go seek his king because he's a true farseer. Right. But like no. (laughs) Fitz for sure would not have gone to seek his king if he had a choice. (laughs) Well, he would have if it was just Molly and Birik, but once he learns True. it's his daughter, he would have turned around. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe with the last skill vision of Verity, he would have come. He would. Yeah. He would have like returned around to go to Verity. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't think he's heartless. I just think that like he it's... wants what he wants. Mm-hmm. And that is a life with his the love of his life and his daughter. And he yeah. wants to raise a child so they don't have to have a a father that's not in their life like he had yeah yeah well thank you very much for sticking with us to finish up chapter 22 this was a long chapter well not not crazy long page wise but there's a <laughs> lot packed in here so there was a lot of content Please let us know if you have any thoughts on all of our ranting this episode. We, <laughs> we, we had strong emotions about a lot of things. Yes. We also did a, like a very long deep dive into the skill. Yeah. So sorry. 
not sorry because <laughs> we'll probably more podcast. of that before we're done. Yeah. So, <laughs> All right. well, thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any feedback or comments or any topics you want to bring up and have us talk about, please let us know. Is fits happy at gmail.com or you can go to our website is fits And we have a bunch of links at the top bar of that, where you can go to all of our social medias and comment on any of those. Leave us a review or a like or share us on your social media. It's the best way to support us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. See you next week. I always feel like it takes me a long time to figure out how to start this part because I don't still don't have a good (laughs) good way to ease into this section. But it's my favorite part. It's time where we get to talk about what you listeners have sent in to us. First and foremost, Luke and I want to give a big thank you to everyone who has sent their Spotify wrapped to us that has had us in their top five podcast or their number one podcast spot. Yeah. And I know that only applies to Spotify listeners, but still we we appreciate everyone listening this past year. Yeah. It's really cool um, to see that something that we do as like a little passion project, um, resonates with people and that you guys like it. Um, and like, like we said, it's only for Spotify listeners that can do that, but it's, I don't know. It's just like kind of fun to see the growth that we've had. And, um, we really appreciate all of you guys, even the ones who don't have Spotify, um, (laughs) and can't prove your love. So Spotify wrapped gives us some, some stats, but the relevant one to everybody is that we have released 2,536 minutes of content across 28 episodes. So you're welcome. That's, uh, from, that's from January 1st to like October 31st is when they they take into account. So that 20 is, episodes through that. Yeah. Yeah. Also, are you guys doing okay after listening to us talk for that long? Um. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, no, but seriously, thank you guys so much. It's been a joy to do this because of you guys. So with the mushy gushy stuff out of the way, <laughs> we'll go into some listener emails that we got sent. So I'm going to start off with an email from a listener named Anna. And they sent in some discussion about episode 82. Particularly about Fitz's skill headaches or lack thereof of what we mentioned. Yes. And they... Related some of their own experiences with migraines to this, these skill headaches, how a person can get very used to the pain that they chronically have mm-hmm. and how they hit differently. So they kind of related them to, you know, sometimes Fitz has a very, very bad skill headache. And that could be a migraine that comes on all of a sudden, kind of upfront, hits you really hard and you notice it. Sometimes they build or are small enough, quote unquote, small enough, right. <laughs> where it will affect your mood and how you react to people around you because your body notices the pain, but you don't subconscious or don't consciously recognize it's happening. And so you get a very dour mood or like react differently until somebody like lets you know and you're like, oh, wait, OK, yes, this is a this is a headache. Right. You know, that's that's kind of what they're relating it to fits here. Where in episode 82, we discussed he didn't have a skill headache and how that was kind of weird. And it might have just been a lingering thing where he had a dour mood and was kind of upset, you know, the rest of the time. Because they're not always going to be the same. Yeah. It's really interesting whenever we get people who have real life experiences that kind of mirror what's going on and can help us understand and contextualize kind of what's going on. And so I really enjoyed hearing Anna's take of what is happening and how the pain can be deceiving. Um, I thought that was very cool. Also, shout out to Anna for feeding my love of animals <laughs> and giving us a really cute picture of of their cat. Yeah, their cat. Very cute. Mm-hmm. Um, so so thank you. Thanks, Anna. OK, and then. Our next email is from listener Melissa, who writes in to talk about episode 84 and how 
Fitz is feeling down about Ketrickin and Chade making plans without him. Yes, we talked about how he's kind of mopey and like being like, no one's reaching out to me. And we were kind of upset with him for not reaching out himself. <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, they let us know that this is something that can happen with people with anxiety. Honestly, yeah, it's happened to me, too. And I, yeah. I wouldn't even say that I have anxiety, but like just falling into the rut of no one's inviting me to things. And then you're not doing anything or inviting them either. Right. I, I think it can happen to a lot of people. And Right. It's not just something people with anxiety suffer yeah. from, but it is something like anxious inducing where mm-hmm. it's this weird loop of. I don't really know if I'm good enough. And then so I don't really want to burden my friends with my presence. And then your friends are doing something without you. And you're like upset because how could they exclude me? I knew it. I'm obviously not good enough. And then you don't reach out or try to include yourself and you just push back further. And it's like this endless cycle. And specifically, Melissa says here. So, yeah, he is wrong to be upset with them for not including him when he hasn't made his needs, wants or intentions clear to them. But also, he probably doesn't even feel worthy enough to clearly state his feelings because of how deeply he disregards his worth as a person. So that's exactly true. I I thought that was a great analysis because that is fits right there. (laughs) Yeah, true. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's really sad that Fitz is going through this. It's sad that people in general have to deal with this. Like, I think we've all had moments, some more than others, but like where you just like are so upset because your friends aren't inviting you places, but you're not asking your friends places either. And I don't know. I just I hate when our boy Fitz is suffering. Right. Um, and I think it is a good reminder that sometimes you have to tell people, you know, Uh, easier said than done because let's be real telling people that you have wants and needs can sometimes be very hard and scary yeah um definitely for no other reason that we're human Mm -hmm. and it just is (laughs) so thank you so much melissa for that insight and helping us to look at it from a different angle and last but not least we have a comment on facebook on episode 85 part one of this chapter from ellen And Ellen is talking about how Chade is freely discussing all of these different plot points in front of Kettle in this conversation and and throughout Fitz ranting and things like that. Kettle's just kind of sitting there knitting. Yeah. You know, drinking her tea or whatever she's doing, knitting, knitting loudly. (laughs) And Chade is talking freely in front of her very freely answering frank questions from Fitz, and ellen was kind of wondering what we thought of that and why why he might be doing that she offered a couple suggestions and i don't know i kind of like the the particular one of cattle kind of already knows stuff because she came in with starling and obviously is a part of Fitz's traveling band and new you know, knew what was happening. <laughs> right. There's definitely the possibility that Chade, Chade knows, like Chade knows that she knows because Starling knows. So why wouldn't she know? And even though we know, we don't know, that's a lot of knows, even <laughs> though we don't know if Kettle knows about the child or all of the things going on, it's pretty safe to bet that she does. Yeah. And Ellen specifically does point out that last chapter, Chade didn't want Ketrickin to know the Molly, the, the names of Molly or Birik. Right. Which is very interesting juxtaposed with this scene where he's talking freely in front of Kettle. Like, Chade is very about restricting information from, even if they might know it, restricting information from anyone so right. secrets don't get out. So Ellen also asks, does he trust Kettle? Which is know. weird because I feel like he doesn't know enough and she would be a very mysterious person for right. him to trust. It's not like he would know her from his childhood either. Right. No. So she's too old for that. Yeah. I don't know. It's an interesting conundrum there and, and a really good thing to point out to us because I'm not 100 percent sure. And I definitely didn't think about it. Maybe it's because she's a reverse rose. But what is. Oh, no. 
What? <laughs> the little girl what? servant. <laughs> oh, Rosemary. Rosemary. Oh my gosh. I am literally the worst what with you, names. Do I don't know by, why I thought I could do this podcast. What do you mean reverse Rosemary? <laughs> well, because nobody suspected Rosemary of being a spy because she was so young, not even changed. Oh, and now he's focused on the young people and not the uh-huh. older. Uh-huh. And so because this older woman is sitting there, he's like, there's no way she could know anything. And like... <laughs> So I'm just saying that not that she's a spy, but maybe. I, I also think that Che does put a lot of stock into how the fool thinks and reacts to people. That's fair. And if the fool is willingly letting Kettle sit there day after day, maybe he does just like, okay, she's been let in this far. You know? That's a fair take. I forget that he really respects the fool. In some cases. Mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Limited amount, but some cases, yes. He, tr- he trusts the fool's judgment. Yes. The fool's judgment. I think he knows that the fool is important and therefore takes stock in what how the fool reacts to things. Fair so. enough. Well, thank you so much for that comment, Ellen. That was great as well. Yes. And thank you to everybody who has reached out. Yeah. It is much more fun doing this with you guys. So thank you all. <laughs>